There are multiple prognostic factors uh, that are used uh, to stratify patients mainly for clinical trials and to provide some sense of prognosis for patients with follicular lymphomas. Uh, the initial one was in the pre-rituxin, rituximab era, uh, was FLIPI, uh, and then this was followed by what we call FLIPI-2 in the uh, rituximab era. Um, I should point out that these prognostic um, factor models do not guide therapy outside the clinical trial. So whether your score is good, intermediate, or bad, it doesn't tell you what should you use for treatment. Uh, but they are good for stratification uh, in the context of clinical trials. Follicular lymphoma is a very heterogeneous disease. And what we've learned over the last few years is that there are se several time points at which we can predict which patients are likely to do well versus those who are likely not to do so well. For example, there's a CR30, patients who remain in remission at 30 months. But that's waiting two and a half years. Then we found from several studies that if a patient is in remission at two years and perhaps even one year, that their survival is comparable to that of an age-matched population without lymphoma. And that accounts for about 80% of patients. But it's that other 20% of patients who have an awful outcome. Their survival is just a few years. And clinical trials are now focusing on that specific group of patients because of their uh, poor survival. But that's still waiting two years, one year. If we're going to affect improvement in patients with follicular lymphoma who are likely not to do so well, we need to bring this closer to treatment. There are a couple of tests we can do following treatment immediately after therapy, looking at minimal residual disease, looking at PET scans, and these predict outcome. But then again, at that point, the patient has already been treated with a potentially ineffective therapy. So where we need to go is looking at predictive markers before treatment. Several of these have been evaluated. Dr. Yunus talked about the M7 Flippy, for example. There's also the metabolic tumor volume using PET scans, which also seems to predict outcome, particularly in combination with the Flippy 2 score. Incorporation of patient comorbidities is important in treatment planning. There are some drugs, for example, anthracyclines, which uh, cannot be given to patients with reduced heart function. Uh, there are other drugs such as vinca alkaloids, which you can't give to patients who have peripheral neuropathy. But now, in the era of targeted therapies, comorbidities become somewhat less relevant, although not totally. For example, idelalicid, the PI3 kinase inhibitor, was approved, at least in CLL, for patients who are not suitable candidates for chemotherapy because of comorbidities, in patients who have abnormal renal function, in patients who have abnormal bone marrow function or reduced performance status. So we still need to recognize the specific toxicities of a drug and tailor our therapies so that we don't risk a patient getting worse because we've given them a drug with a specific toxicity. But the targeted therapies are much safer than some of the more standard toxic chemotherapies.